welcome back. This time we're going to talk about the 1700s, this fascinating time period when 13 British colonies became the United States of America and how people began to understand themselves as American. And we're going to look at what role Christianity and the Christian church played in this transformation. So we could call this period the, the period of Americanization, the 1700s. And here is where we are in the schedule, week three out of nine. So the two big factors in the Americanization of the 1700s were two rev words, revival and revolution. And revival, specifically the Great Awakening, the first Great Awakening, it's called, and revolution, which is the war for independence or the Revolutionary War, depending on the perspective you took. So let's start with revival. So the Great Awakening was a religious revival that went on for years in the 1730s through the 1760s in all of the 13 colonies. And it created this renewed religious enthusiasm at a time when the early Puritan enthusiasm had kind of cooled in the generation after those first colonists. And also, this was a time when rationalist ideas or the rationalism of the Enlightenment, those ideas were coming into the colonies from, from Europe, and people were starting to question the supernatural. Now, I want to focus on two main preachers in North America and a lay woman. And also note that the Great Awakening was actually happening on both sides of the North Atlantic. Um, we, we're going to talk about what happened in the colonies, but this was also happening over in, um, in the other side of the Atlantic as well. So the first person that we're going to talk about, the first uh, Great Awakening preacher was, was a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, and he was an American preacher, and he's been called the greatest early American theologian. Now, the first signs of this Great Awakening, this, this uh, revival, happened in Northampton, Massachusetts, and the pastor there was none other than this man, Jonathan Edwards, and he was a staunch Puritan, and, and he was convinced of the, of the need for people to have a personal conversion experience. And he'd been preaching in Northampton for, for several years with kind of average results until 1734, when his preaching began to have some surprising results, began evoke, evoking responses that surprised him. People began responding to his sermons, some of them with emotional outbursts during the service, uh, many of them with remarkable changes in their lives and with increased attention to their, their personal spiritual devotional life and their practices. And in a few months after this started, it spread all across Massachusetts and, and into Connecticut. The second Great Awakening preacher we need to bring in is George Whitfield. Now, George Whitfield was English, not American, not from the colonies. And he was a traveling evangelist preaching in England before he headed over to the colonies. And he came over shortly after Jonathan Edwards' experience had, had broken out. He was an Anglican. And remember that the Puritans didn't care for the Anglicans. But nonetheless, the Puritan, Jonathan Edwards, invited George Whitfield to speak at his church because he had heard about uh, all of his tremendous preaching success. And it's said that while Jonathan Whitfield, the visitor, preached, um, Jonathan Edwards wept. And the awakening, the, this, this new awakening had renewed uh, momentum. Whitfield traveled throughout all of the colonies, all, all the way through all of them, through Georgia. He was an enormously active and energetic uh, traveling preacher. And his plain language preaching spoke to plain people. And also his appeal to emotion spoke to people. And his preaching led to the conversion of, of many. And there were outwards expressions of repentance and joy when he preached. Other uh, 
preachers that were Congregationalists and Presbyterian who were, uh, that's what the Puritans were called at this point. They were known not as Puritans, but as Congregationalists and Presbyterians. So some of them started following his example and going out and, and traveling around and preaching. And this was something completely new. And, and preachers who stayed home and stayed in their pulpits didn't travel around they came into their pulpits with this new enthusiasm, this new zeal for the, for the gospel. And picture this happening up and down all 13 colonies. There, there are people weeping in repentance for their sins and people, people shouting for joy at having been pardoned. And people who were so overcome with emotion that they fainted. I want to read an excerpt from a diary from 1740 from a farmer by the name of Nathan Cole. Remember I said that these people love to keep diaries and, and, uh, and journals. So I'm gonna read from the diary of Nathan Cole, a farmer in 1740. I was in my field at work. I dropped my tool that I had in my hand and ran home to my wife telling her to make ready quickly to, to go and hear Mr. Whitfield preach at Middletown. Then I ran to my pasture for my horse with all my might, fearing that I should be too late. As I came near to the road, I heard a noise, something like a, a low rumbling thunder. And presently, I found it was the noise of horses feet coming down the road. Every horse seemed to go with all his might to carry his rider to hear news from heaven for the saving of souls. It made me tremble. I turned and looked toward the great river, the Connecticut River, and saw the, the ferry boats running swift backward and forward, bringing over loads of people. The land and banks over the river looked black with people and horses. All along the 12 miles, I saw no man at work in his field, but all seemed to be gone. When I saw Mr. Whitfield come upon the scaffold, he looked almost angelical, a young, slim, slender youth before some thousands of people with a bold, undaunted countenance and my hearing how God was with him everywhere as he came, as he came, it solemnized my mind and put me into a trembling fear before he began to preach. For he looked as if he were clothed with authority from the great God and a sweet solemn solemnity sat upon his brow and my hearing him preach gave me a heart wound. By God's blessing, the old foundation was broken up and I saw that my righteousness would not save me. Just this great description of the intensity and that just the, the fervor and the, the, even the celebrity of George Whitfield at the time, it was something we can't even imagine probably. I wanna just talk a little bit about the characteristics of this great awakening. So again, we had animated preachers and George Whitfield is you know, the example. We, we have in, in the crowds of people listening, we have shrieking and weeping and fainting. There's this real emphasis on a spiritual journey, on your personal connection with God, a lot of emotion and passion, and really very focused on the experience. And now one more case study. This is of a woman um, by the name of Sarah Osborne. Osborne. And Catherine Breckis, who is an historian of religion in America at Harvard Divinity School, has actually researched and published in 2017 all the diaries, the memoir, the letters of this woman from, from Rhode Island, Sarah Osborne. Now, Sarah was converted at a George Whitfield uh, event. And during the 60, 1760s and 1770s, she was known during her lifetime for leading a religious revival at her house. And in her house, um, men and women, uh, free and slave, would all congregate together to, to, to study the word and to pray and to hear preaching. And I, I, I've, I've read her 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 words, and they just really give you a deeper understanding of the 18th century America, of these 1700s, uh, into the experience of women's spiritual authority, of 
the beginning of the American Revolution. She writes some about that and the rise of this evangelical movement. She helped build, um, along with Whitfield and others, this new kind of Christianity, this new movement, um, evangelicalism, which came out of this great awakening, which really emphasized this personal relationship with God, this joy of being born again, and the call to spread the gospel around the globe. Very different from the, the very hierarchical sort of quiet, calm, Puritan services and, and expressions of Christianity. And another thing that I like about Sarah Osborne and just reading her work is it reminds me that historical change is not just about famous people like George Whitefield or Jonathan Edwards, but historical change happens because of the hopes and the aspirations of ordinary people like Sarah Osborne, like us. Let's talk a little bit about the outcomes of this Great Awakening. So first of all, there was some more division that was created out of this in American Christianity. We'd already seen um, Puritans, we'd seen Baptists, we'd seen Anglicans. And so it, there's already variety and, and division, but now, we, now we're seeing something called old lights and new lights. And old lights were the, the, the Puritans and the Anglicans who, who worshipped in this sort of quiet, staid way. And the new lights were the, um, the people like Whitfield and, and Edwards and the, the, uh, John Wesley, who's going to come along later and, and be the founder of Methodism. But, but just this ex very expressive Christianity, emotional, powerful sermons, this emphasis on experience versus these you know, traditional old lights who were really against this, these sensational styles of, of preaching and these appeals to emotion. And you could have, uh, say, congregationalists, like take one denomination, you could have one church that's an old light and one church that's a new light congregationalist. And the same with, you know, the, the Presbyterians and the, the Baptists and the Anglicans. So we have a, more of a, a variety is increasing in American Christianity. And again, just to emphasize, we see this shift from English Puritanism towards American evangelicalism. There's some strengthening of females uh, voice um, and a spiritual authority in this time. Women began to have a little bit more of a voice, although not too loud, but a little bit more. Um, we see this active individualized Protestantism. It's not so much about, although it is, but it's not quite as much about the, the community. It's, it's, there's more about the individual and also real emphasis on lay people versus, versus authority. And really these things started to create a, 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 a feeling of a democratization. And this is gonna affect where people are gonna be going to church. Let me show you this uh, table here. So this shows the difference between, of, of all the um, Christians in the United States in 1776, and again, again in 1850, which denominations they were most likely to be associated with. And in 1776, it was by far the Puritan, the Puritan denominations, the Congregationalists, the Presbyterians, um, and then the Baptists and the Episcopalians, which are the Anglicans. In less than 100 years, this is going to shift dramatically to where the Methodists and the Baptists have the greatest share of Christianity, of Christians in their denominations, and Presbyterians and Congregationalists especially fall just way to the bottom. And even at, at this point uh, in uh, in American Christianity, you, you'll be hard pressed, hard pressed to find many Congregationalist churches when you leave New England. There are some, but not very many. Just a few more comments about the Great Awakening and why it's called great. So first of all, it touched so many people and aspects of colonial life. 
and it was America's first truly national event. It brought this sense of, of being American. There's something that is holding them together now, this idea of being American, because something has happened for all of them. The same thing has happened for all of them um, outside of their European, the European experience. There's out of it is called great because this new model of leadership uh, evolves, this traveling evangelist kind of kind of model. And it starts to change the social order. Like I said, there was there starts to be some democratization, more democratization. Um, and this is gonna have an impact on, on some other things. Um, at the same time that this the revivals are happening, there are these new ideas that are circulating that coming from the Enlightenment in Europe, these new ideas about human rights and the nature of government. And these ideas, these, govern, these philosophies of government and natural rights and things are going to combine with these outcomes of the great awakening of, of more democratization and, and being, an, being an, uh, an American. These are gonna come together and just create this, these momentous events. And I just wanted to add one more thing here that revivals, these big revivals like this, they're, they're about way more than people becoming Christians. There was a lot that happened here that changed the nature of the, the 13 colonies out of this great awakening. So now we turn to the question, what role did Christianity and the church play in the American Revolution? Well, suppose you're a regular Christian in the colonies in 1775 and you're seeing things and you're hearing things, these debates about taxation and representation and, the, and British troops are over here enforcing King George's sovereignty and New England, New England people are under siege by the British and there's tr troops quartered in Boston and uh, tea from Britain is being dumped into the harbor. All these things that we know about from the American um, Revolutionary War, and you're seeing these things at the time, and who are you going to turn to for direction? There's no president, there's no Supreme Court, there's no public, public defenders, none of that. So who are you going to turn to for advice? And the answer to that is where you're going to turn to is where you have been turning to for direction for over a century. You're going to turn to the prophets of your society, your ministers. And back then, the colonial sermon was hugely influential. The colonial sermon was prophetic witness. It was the newspaper. It was the video internet. It was community uh, college. It was social therapist. It was everything, the, the, the sermon. And the range of, the, of its influence, the influence of the sermon and on all aspects of your life back then, it would, it would probably make contemporary television, I don't know about the internet, but definitely make contemporary television pale in comparison to the influence that the, that the sermon had. And remember from last week how they perceived themselves? They're, they're not a ragtag religious bunch of exiles, but they're God's special people with a glorious commission. Remember the city on the hill? And so what were these preachers proclaiming in these extraordinarily influential sermons? Well, briefly, they were saying that tyranny is idolatry. No monarch could claim sovereignty. Only God could claim sovereignty. And they were, the, the, the sermons were saying that the colonists needed to fight for what they had been commissioned by God to do, build a new heaven and a new earth in America. And the, they preached with words like freedom and liberty, which are both political and religious in themes and connotation. And the political and the religious connotations were virtually impossible for the colonists to separate. <laughs> 
One influential minister was 32-year-old um, Concord, Massachusetts minister, William Emerson. So right down the road uh, for, for many of us here. William F. Emerson um, would become the grandfather of Ralph Waldo Emerson. So Emerson and the people of Concord knew that British spies had infiltrated their town and informed a British general of a hidden armory and munitions supplies that they had, had hidden away. And that they, they believed that the British were planning a preemptive strike on the, these supplies. So the Concord militia mustered on March 13, 1775, and Emerson preached a sermon from Second Chronicles 13, 12. It was probably his mo most momentous sermon because he had it within his means to promote or discourage um, an almost certainly violent call to arms. So what did he say? Well, he warned them of an, of an approaching storm of war and bloodshed, and he called on them to be ready with martial skills of war, but also moral and spiritual resolve. He told them that they needed to know and believe in what they were fighting for and trust in God's power to uphold them or otherwise they'd scatter in fear before the superior British redcoats. He spoke in political terms and he combined in his, his sermon and in his, his, his person, he combined the roles of prophet and statesman. So he's calling for colonial resistance. And here are a couple of things that he said in that sermon that day, March 13th, 1775. For my part, the more I reflect upon the movements of the British nation, the more satisfied I am that our military preparation here for our own defense is justified in the eyes of the impartial world. Nay, for should we neglect to defend ourselves by military preparation, we could never answer it to God and to our own consciences of the rising generations. And he also said, the Lord will cover your head in the day of battle and carry you on from victory to victory. And in the end, he, he concluded with some words that, uh, to the effect that the whole world would know that there is a God in America. So words like Emerson's um, continued to sound out from pulpits pushing and, and uh, impelling colonists forward in this course of independence. And the pulpit served as the single most powerful voice to inspire the colonists. For them, the religious dimension of the war was precisely the point of the revolution. Independence and a new government of the citizens would enable Americans to realize their destiny as the city on a hill. Here are a couple of more examples. So um, Emerson was from Massachusetts. Uh, on the left here is Peter Mullen Mullenberg. And he was from, he was actually a German Lutheran in Pennsylvania, but he moved to Virginia where you remember the whole, all the churches were pretty much Anglican. So he was ordained as an Anglican uh, preacher. And he happened to be present at St. John's Church in Richmond, Virginia when Patrick Henry, Patrick Henry was a very strong Christian. He gave his immortal cry, give me liberty or give me death. And Peter um, Mullenberg was so moved that he enlisted under George Washington. And he returned to his congregation to give his final sermon. And after reading from Ecclesiastes 3, the chapter that says there's a time for this and a time for that, after he read all that, he said, there is a time to preach and a time to pray, but there is also a time to fight, and that time has now come. And Mullenberg threw off his robes to reveal a, the uniform of a militia colonel underneath, and he, he began recruiting the men of his congregation, who became known as the German Regiment, and he, lead, he led them throughout the war. So we have Emerson in Mass, Mullenberg in Virginia, and we also have Samuel Langdon, down here in the bottom right. He was the pastor of a congregational church in Portsmouth, New Hampshire. And that's the Samuel Langdon house there in the, the picture in the right and, uh, top. And that's actually still there in Portsmouth. Well, Samuel Langdon had helped defend Bunker Hill 
and he returned to his church to announce that he was going to devote himself as a full-time chaplain to the Patriot, the Patriot troops. And he wrote in his diary, again, great, great historical sources. He wrote in his diary of the scene of that day when he went back to his church and he told them that he was going to become a chaplain in his entry for July 20th, 1775, he says that one of the deacons, a 60, 60 year old man by the name that he calls Deacon S, um, he said that his deacon stood up and said this, brethren, our minister has acted right. This is God's cause. And as in days of old, the priests bore the ark into the midst of battle, so must they do it now. We should be unworthy of, our, of the fathers and mothers who landed on Plymouth Rock if we do not cheerfully bear what providence shall put upon us in the great conflict now before us. I had two sons at Bunker Hill and one of them you know was slain. The other did his duty and for the future, God must do with him what seemeth best. I offer him to liberty. I had thought I would stay here with the church but my minister is going and I will shoulder my musket and go too. And notice here that this continued sense of identification shared with the Israelites and this time sharing the identification with them of going into battle with the priests. A question, a question to ponder. is what do you think about these ministers, how they combine Christian and political themes in their sermons? And this is a quote from one of the historians that I read. He said, in some instances on both the British and the American sides, loyalty to the political cause was equated with loyalty to Christ. And this conflation, this making of one of Christian liberty and political liberty did not and has not gone away. In the center here, we have a poster from the 1976 bicentennial celebration and the declaration with the verse from 2 Corinthians, where the spirit of the Lord is, there is liberty, this conflation of political and spiritual liberty. And here are a couple of images from uh, last year and this year, where there's a conflation of spiritual and political. One more thing to think about before we end. So besides Christianity, another um, intellectual movement that influenced many, many of the educated in the colonies came from the Enlightenment of the 1700s. And this, the Enlightenment philosophy elevated reason over revelation from God as the chief source of human knowledge. And in terms of religion, Enlightenment thinkers of the 1700s were what we call deist, deist. They believed in a God who was like a watchmaker that he set the universe running and then he let people manage it by reason. He had, and he wasn't involved whatsoever in the in any supernatural way in the in the uh, ongoing history of the world. And Enlightenment thinkers wanted to found specifically these um, Enlightenment thinkers in the colonies who went to war against Britain. They wanted to found a just and free society on rational scientific principles create an earthly utopia, kind of like a secular version of the millennium. And the key terms that they used were not of scripture, but of political ideas of liberty, reason, progress, the natural rights of man, those types of things. And deists were among our most important founding fathers. Benjamin Franklin was a deist. Thomas Jefferson was a deist and likely George Washington, John Adams, and, and James Madison. Now historians debate which ideas most energized and produced the American Revolution. Was it evangelical Christianity that we've talked about 
or was this in this uh, enlightenment deism? And historians disagree, but one historian wrote, and I, this is what I think, that they did not cause, they were not separate channels, but they flowed as one stream towards the crisis of 1776. In the Continental Congress, the body that governed American affairs from 1774 to 1789, the deists were the strongest presence. There were Christians there, but the deists were the strongest presence. They sought to model cooperation with the Christians. Um, for example, the Declaration of in, uh, Independence has four references to God, but they were essentially deist terms for God that didn't, um, but for the Christians, they didn't say, well, take those out because they didn't deny the Christian faith, but they were not typical ways of um, Orthodox Christians describing God, things like nature's God and divine providence. By the, by the time 1787 to 1789, when the constitution was written and ratified, there were no mention, there was no mention of God as foundation at all, not even in deist terms. Overtly Christian matters were not a concern in 1787 to 89 in the writing of the constitution like they had been in 1775 when William Emerson preached that, that sermon about taking up arms to the conquered militia. And I just wanna read the preamble to the constitution just with all that in mind, this language in the preamble to the constitution is enlightenment language, not city on a hill language anymore. So listen to that. We, the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare, and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity, do ordain and establish this Constitution for the United States of America. All right, that's it for this talk. Next time, we're going to look again at the 1700s. We're going to look at this period of uh, Americanization of, through revival and revolution. And we're going to look at it through the lens of race. So thank you. And I will see you then.